Sclerotinia minor is a fungus that causes sclerotinia blight of peanuts. The symptoms for sclerotinia minor are quite distinct, quite unique. The main symptom are the formation of black sclerotia on the lower stem area, such as you see in this picture. The, the sclerotia are fairly small, uh, less than half an inch in size, and they go up and down the stem. They'll also form in the roots. Uh, there's only one other fungus that forms sclerotia that are t similar to sclerotinia minor, and that would be botrytis. And so if you see that symptom, you know that it's one or the other of the two fungi. The other symptom that's fairly distinct with sclerotinia blight is that the plants, even though they die, the lower stem area is tan or brown. It is not black. And that is very unusual. When peanuts die, they typically are black throughout. But with sclerotinia minor, you will see tan symptoms on the lower part of the stem. The other and final symptom that's unique for sclerotinia blight are the shredding of the stems, where you actually see the stems are in tatters and pieces. And that's, again, a very unusual symptom. That means you either have sclerotinia blight or botrytis. Now, those two di diseases are impossible to separate in the field. If you have the sclerotia symptom, the only way to separate those two fungi is by laboratory analyses. Sclerotinia minor is a classic soil-borne fungus, which means uh, from an epidemiology standpoint, the disease that you get during the season spreads very little. So if you have a, a plant that's infected, you might get the plant next to it infected on either side or maybe two plants down, but your spread is very, very slow. It's plant to plant and it, it doesn't spread much within the season. Most of the spread that occurs with sclerotinia blight is between seasons. It's the sclerotia being spread by humans driving through the field, picking up soil and sclerotia, moving it into new fields, moving it around the field, and even more with cultivation. You take a, a concentration of sclerotia, and when you deep break and do all your cultivation before your next peanut crop, you've spread it at sometimes nine or 12 times the area that that initial plant encompassed. And so most of your spread with a classic soil-borne fungus is going to be between seasons. Now, this is very important from a control standpoint. If you have one plant that's showing symptoms and you treat that plant late so that it dies, then you've already lost all you're going to lose or you're not going to lose very much more. So what you have to keep in mind when you're managing this particular disease is that with a soil-borne disease, it's important that you treat it very quickly or you lose, your, you, you lose the value of your pot because it's not going to spread very much. So what you see is the area, in fact, that's going to be most likely to be infected. And so delay can be very critical in control. Now, 2004 was a very wet, cool summer, and we actually saw sclerotinia minor uh, spread in what looks to be an airborne manner. This is extremely unusual, uh, probably driven by the weather, and it's still being, uh, I guess that theory is still being tested. Sclerotinia minor does have an airborne stage that can be produced under cool, cool conditions. And the, usually typical maybe in the early spring or late in the fall, not during the growing season. And so if, if that's the in actual case what occurred in 2004, that, that really is a, a deviation in the normal behavior for sclerotinia minor. I can talk about what to do with our normal soil-borne spread pattern. And that's, that's what I'm going to emphasize for today. The first thing you want to do is limit spread. You want to wash equipment off so you do not introduce it into new fields. That's the number one thing you can do is prevent spread. We discovered last year, we discovered that uh, disinfectants like Clorox do not kill sclerotinia minor. Even if you soak the the sclerotia in Clorox for 10 minutes, you do not kill it at all. It survives it wonderfully. So the most important thing you can do is to uh, wash equipment off very well with water. Now we are testing a new product called Ozium that was suggested to us by a consultant. Um, and this does appear to stop sclerotinia if you get it uh, if you get it really well coated 
Now my concern is that when sclerotinia has a sclerotia buried in soil and you're trying to you know, clean off your legs, a light spray like that is not apt to be infect effective. You're going to have to really, really coat it. And so I'm not sure how effective osium will be, but, but I will say right now it's the best disinfectant we've seen, but you do have to coat very thoroughly. So prevention of contaminating new fields, um, trying to minimize equipment movement in your fields that you currently have the disease in, uh, you know, take your diseased areas and handle them last if that's possible. Uh, those are kind of things that are, that are useful for controlling sclerotinia. Now in terms of chemical control, we've had recently, in the last few years, we've had some products, some new fungicides come out that are just remarkable. There's two, one's called Omega 500, the other is called Endura. Omega 500 is made by Syngenta, Endura is produced by BASF. Now these products control approximately 70% of your sclerotinia blight, assuming you get your uh, sprays out timely, early before symptoms start or right after symptoms start. You can expect at least 70% control. What that means is you don't get a lot of production of sclerotia throughout the plant, so you're cutting down your inoculum for future years, uh, as well as possibly saving that plant plus the plants next to it that, that get the disease. Now the older products, for example, Rovrol used to be recommended. In contrast, Rovrol would only protect about, save you about 30% of the infection. And so you would still lose 70% of your area that was infected. And so these new products are just far, far more effective. And it's nice to have tools like that available. There is some question about whether some fairly weak sclerotinia materials such as Topsin M should be sprayed in sclerotinia fields, and that's still under investigation. Uh, I will say that uh, I, from what I've seen, they are not as effective as Omega or Endura. Uh, they are also a lot cheaper, but at this point, I'm not prepared to say they don't work at all, but you, you get what you pay for, very simply. You're scouting a field, and you see uh, dead plants, a patch of dead plants. You look at the plants and you observe that there are tan uh, colored lower stem area, tan to brown, you observe the black sclerotia. So now you have a decision to make. Do you have sclerotinia, do you have botrytis? If the field has previously been a sclerotinia field, then you assume it's sclerotinia, sclerotinia and you treat accordingly. Uh, but you still want to confirm it. And so in that case, you either send the sample into the uh, Lubbock uh, Research and Extension Center, uh, care of Terry Wheeler to look at, to isolate, or you send it to the diagnostic clinic in College Station. Now, I will not charge for the samples and I will uh, process them immediately. However, it takes a minimum of seven days for me to isolate that fungus, which means you probably have to make a treatment decision before you get the results back. And so my recommendation, if you see a small patch with sclerotinia in a field that has not previously had sclerotinia, is you spot treat for sclerotinia. You spot treat with something like Omega or Endura. And then when you get the results, you can make your decision about whether to treat the whole circle with uh, a sclerotinia material, whether to treat it with a botrytis material. In this case, we're recommending something like Topsin M for botrytis or Benelate. Uh, much less expensive materials. But it will take at least seven days to get results regardless of where you send that sample and you should make a treatment decision before seven days. And that's very important with this disease. Another way to control diseases in general is through crop rotation. However, with organisms that form sclerotia like sclerotinia minor, rotation hasn't been all that effective. Uh, even a four-year rotation, while it may reduce the inoculum out there, doesn't eliminate it completely. And even one sclerotia sitting next to a plant root is enough to cause infection and kill that plant and, and continue the epidemic. And so while rotation is never a bad thing with peanuts, it's not going to eliminate the problem. It may help reduce it. All your sclerotia that are present in the top four inches of the soil and within an inch or two of that root system, that's the inoculum that's going to cause your disease. And so things like deep breaking and all sorts of other activities that have been done to try to bring the sclerotia down deeper, 
really haven't eliminated the problem completely from fields. They may actually have some benefit in reducing it, but still you will have sclerotinia next time that field is in peanuts. And in that four-year rotation, even an eight-year rotation has been found to be insufficient to eliminate sclerotinia minor from fields. And so rotation is, is just not a solution. It may help, but it's not a solution. And ultimately, the weather will dictate whether that little bit of inoculum becomes a lot of sclerotinia blight or becomes just a, a small patch of sclerotinia blight. And of course, we can't control the weather. The weather uh, makes disease is worse when we have cool, wet conditions. And it, regardless of what disease you want to talk about, they all fungi, fungal diseases will become worse under cool, wet conditions. Uh, the thing that was special about 2004 was we seemed to have an airborne spread pattern. And if we got the, the ASCO spores being produced, uh, that would require some really unique weather conditions and something that we're still in the process of studying and haven't well defined yet. Uh, my knowledge of sclerotinia minor is that it doesn't produce ascospores unless we get down to about 60 degrees for several weeks. Uh, and that did not occur during the growing season. We, did, we got that cool for at least 48 hours, but not, not for several weeks. And so we, uh, we have our work cut out for us trying to understand how we got the airborne spread pattern, uh, whether or not we actually do get ascospores under different conditions than, than I thought we got them under.